So tonight's um, from the clinic to the living room, I'm very excited about. This is actually a topic that was the very first inaugural Facebook Live um, from a couple of years ago now. Um, and we decided that with all of the updates with sunscreen and some new things that have been in the news lately, that it would be really great to do sort of a you know, all things sunscreen part two. Um, and I have a wonderful special guest tonight. Her name is Dr. Beth Goldstein. She's a board certified dermatologist from Chapel Hill, North uh, Carolina. Um, it's so nice of you to join us. I just wanted to give you a couple seconds to introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about what you do in your practice and then we'll get started. Okay. Hi, Melissa. Thank you so much for having me and just think your work at AIM is just awesome and what you do in your work. So I am a dermatologist of over 30 years and I've specialized in Mohs surgery, which for those of you who don't know what that means, that's a special type of skin cancer treatment. So pretty much all day, what I do is take care of skin cancer patients. And in my spare time, I've developed a men's skin health solutions company with my daughter. That's awesome. So I, um, you know, I just want to start really quickly because Mohs, like in a melanoma setting, like we don't typically see a lot of patients with Mohs. So um, not only is this great for our melanoma patients, but we're also um, live bro broadcasting to the just general skin cancer foundation. So this will be great information for both patients with melanoma, patients with basal cell, patients with squamous cell, and hopefully people that we're trying to prevent all of those things from happening as well. So um I guess I always like to start um, because I, my background as a physician assistant is very highly based in education. Um, I always like to kind of start with a teachable moment. So um, one thing that patients sometimes don't understand is like, why are we wearing sunscreen in the first place? Like, why do we sun, why do we burn in the sun? Um, did you want to, to explain a little bit about that for me and for all of our listeners first? Absolutely. So sunburn happens due to ultraviolet from the sun. It's radiation. So when you think about like radiation for cancer, um, you know, the skin burns and gets red and inflamed. Well, this is just happening to come from the sun and it's ultraviolet radiation and it's damaging the skin. And when we have to have radiation for melanoma or squamous cell or breast cancer or whatever, that certainly penetrates much deeper but you're still talking about um, causing death to those cells at the very top layer. And when that happens, your skin turns red and sometimes those cells die and what you see is a blister and that blister peels off. Sometimes if you're lucky, you tan instead of just burning. Some people only burn, some people burn and then tan. And tan is actually a production of melanin in your skin that's trying to protect because you're damaging it and it's your skin's ability to try to protect itself from further damage. That's a really, really good explanation. And I always try to tell my patients in clinic too, that like a tan is not a good thing. A tan is an indication that you got enough sun to cause melanocyte production, which is actually not good. So, right. you know, we talk about we talk about tans versus burning. And while it's good that people tan in the sun versus burn in the sun, tans are also in and of itself an indication that you got too much sun, right? So um, all of our talk tonight is gonna primarily revolve around avoiding that from happening. Um, so I guess the biggest thing that I wanna start with um, is the differences between the sunscreens. Um, you know, there's, chemical sunscreens, there's physical blocking sunscreens that are called, you know, mineral blocking sunscreens. And um, if you can delineate for our listeners, you know, the difference between those two things um, first, I have some follow-up things I want to talk about with that, but, if, but that's where I kind of want to start with, with what are sunscreens in general. Absolutely. So sunscreens have been around for a long time and they're just getting better and better. And there are I think it's easier to say mineral versus chemical than organic and inorganic because I think that's kind of hard to keep straight. Right. So mineral sunscreens are easier to talk about because people understand minerals. So mineral sunscreens are from zinc, titanium, and iron, particularly if you have a pigmented sunscreen or makeup. And those tend to reflect the ultraviolet radiation. They also do some absorption, but mostly they just reflect the ultraviolet radiation. 
the chemical sunscreens actually absorb that energy and they release chem um, a reactive oxygen species in response and they can actually make your skin a little hotter um, but that they both depending on which ones they are can help protect you against all of the rays of the sun that are damaging so the old sunscreens back in the day i'm from 1987 i remember i got this call from public radio i was in georgia doing my residency and they said what do you have to say about all you need is spf 15 and that's all you need my naivety, I was like, oh, yes, you know, you won't burn. Well, if you use SPF 15 correctly, you won't burn, but you also will be out there comfortably getting a lot more radiation causing cancer. So sure. that is kind of a mixed bag, but pretty much you've got chemical and you've got physical. And there's a lot of differences that I know will wait for you to ask me about. No, it's okay. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously I, I definitely want to make sure our listeners understand the difference between the two of them. Um, but I guess like, and, and also to your point, like the best kind of sunscreen, like there's not one that's better or worse than the other in terms of, um, you know, well, you should only wear mineral or you should only wear chemical. Really, they both work in different ways to protect your skin. And really the best sunscreen is the one you wear. So I think we just need to make sure our listeners like understand the differences between them. So if you, if you could go into that, that would be super helpful. So you're looking for sunscreens that are broad spectrum. So what does that mean? It's not only blocking the rays that cause burning, which we call UVB, but also broad spectrum means it also protects you against UVA, which are longer wavelengths of light, which are actually present all year long, not just in the summer. Mm -hmm. And those rays are actually in really high concentrations in tanning beds, which we know cause cancer. So UVA actually penetrates a little deeper in your skin to promote cancer. So what you're wanting is a combination or enough concentration of a single sunscreen that will protect you against everything. Right. And so sometimes it's a mixture of certain chemicals. Sometimes it's a higher concentration of one over the other. The thing about mineral sunscreens in particular is if you have sensitive skin, um, that if you're a child, you know, if you're, you've got a mom or a dad of young children, then you want to stick with the mineral ones because they're not absorbed. And we can go into that more detail, but there's certain situations where you really do want to go with mineral mm -hmm. versus chemical, but they all are effective. Right. So, and, and it seems as though the, the mineral sunscreens, at least in my experience, it's more like the zinc that actually causes the reaction on people's skin when they say like it irritates them, right. Or the titanium likely. And sometimes it's what it's mixed into it's vehicle. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the, the inert mineral doesn't cause it, but it's what it's mixed into to help it smooth in. Okay. Because with the newer zinc and titanium ones are trying to visible so you don't have that thick white look like mm -hmm. you know the old days of the zinc so it's becoming small molecules called um, micronized or non-nano mm -hmm. and then there is nano those are teeny tiny particles um, and so that's how you kind of differentiate between the mineral some blocks what's going on Okay. So you had mentioned while you were talking and I don't want to skip over it that's why I'm going to like pause in my linear idea but um you had talked about with young kids and such about um, the chemicals being absorbed into the skin. And I know, especially a couple of years ago and, and this summer, there was a, a lot of a lot of news articles. You saw a lot of things um, in papers talking about how um, chemical sunscreens can be absorbed into the skin and they're not safe. And, and I know that, you know, the FDA has changed some of their recommendations so that they actually are reporting that some of these chemicals can be absorbed. Um, there's been a real mixed bag in terms of, um, opinions as to whether or not like that makes a huge difference. Um, and so, you know, I, I would love to hear your thoughts as a, from a dermatology perspective, you know, about how worrisome that really is, I guess. Absolutely. So it's oxybenzone and octanoxate a little bit, but especially zone that was applied uh, very aggressively, and it was found in the bloodstream. And so the FDA said, well, only the mineral sunscreens are considered generally recognized as safe or GRAS. 
And so those, the FDA just kind of grandfathered in and said, we have no concerns. But with these other chemical sunscreens, we need some more data. It's not to say that there's, there's no data that says it actually causes harm, right. but there needs to be more information out there to confirm this. And so um, I heard a really interesting talk and it was saying kind of, once the cat is out of the bag, the sound bite, the sunscreens are bad, it's hard to pull that back. Right. And the real message I think we should focus on is sunscreens are just part of a sun protection program. And the idea that you're supposed to be slathering your whole body with sunscreens needs to be really talked about. That sunscreens are an adjunct to wearing a hat, to wearing sunglasses, to have protective to seek shade, to avoid midday, and that we shouldn't just be saying, and I know a lot of people say, well, what about the sunscreen? I'm like, that sunscreen is perfectly thick enough and appropriately, but you really should be using these other sun protection measures. Right. And not really slabbing all over your body. So truly, you know, small amounts where you should be only using it, where you're exposed, it's probably fine. Right. And I do think we all look forward to having, you know, good data that says what is safe, what's safe for humans, what's safe for the environment. But I think we're awfully quick to say, well, if it had it in this little study, then it must be terrible. Well, right. what is terrible is the, sun, is the skin cancer epidemic. That's what's well, terrible. It's absolutely terrible. You are absolutely correct. And um, you kind of transitioned us into talking about other alternatives to sunscreen because you know, there are some folks that um, think that, well, I, I put on my, you know, 30 SPF, I'm going to go out in the sun and I'm not going to reapply and blah, 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 blah. Um, and I know in our clinic, we're not dermatology, like my clinic is not dermatology. My clinic is, is oncology based and, you know, but we always try to stress, you know, wear your hat, a floppy hat, you know, wearing a baseball cap is great for this part of your face, but it doesn't cover your ears and the back of your neck and the sides of your face. And, um, you know, wearing the sun protective clothing now is so nice. Um, you know, as long as you remember not to use fabric softener, I uh, like, feel like every time I talk about protective clothing, I have to like plug, don't use fabric softener in there. Um, I'm going to get like a t-shirt made, I think for my work, but they, um, now this it's not so heavy so they have like very very sheer material that is very protective of the sun um what other things can can folks use or have you seen out there absolutely so there's also a laundry additive called sun guard that you can get it online i'm not sure where you can get it in stores i hear different things different years but it's s-u-n-g-u-a-r-d sun guard and supposedly you can add it to your laundry and make your regular clothes like UPF clothing for three washings. And so you don't have to, if you don't want to invest in UPF clothing, although, as you said, it's gotten much, much better. Mm -hmm. You know, it used to look pretty geeky and now it's actually looking nicer um, that you can, I think for a lot of people just get that one oversized shirt and you can wear a no sleeve shirt, a little t-shirt under it and wear that big shirt over it and keep it open so you don't feel maybe like you're gonna get so hot and right. have that great protection. Because as you said, you have to reapply every two hours. And honestly, if you're wearing a shirt, just need to put it on your face and neck. And of course you're wearing your hat, trying to get people to understand you're the smartest person out there if you're wearing that hat with a brown. People yep. go, oh no, I can't do that. I'm like, set the fashion trend, right? <laughs> um, you know, shade is very important. I was at the beach a couple of weeks ago and they have these great new, easy to put up shades, mm -hmm. structures, and that can be helpful. Trying to avoid midday. If you're out at a kid's sporting event, take a tent, yeah. you know, do things that actually just protect you. But realize like if you're at the beach or on the water, it's gonna keep coming back up at you. So even you're under shade, you still need to reapply every couple of hours when you're out there. And sunglasses. I always try to remind my patients that you need to protect your eyes as well. Um, not only from sun, but also for glaucoma purposes and aging and things like that. So um, it's one there thing is, I always try to remember. We do talk about antioxidants. Certainly, I think with your cancer patients and everybody, you know, you want to be eating those wonderful, brightly colored fruits and salmon, because um, that's just good all around. There are also a little bit of data 
that's good that says if you take vitamin B3, mm-hmm. a form of nicotinamide, not niacin, because that makes right. you flush and blush like crazy, but nicotinamide or niacinamide, if you have a history of non-melanoma skin cancer, it could reduce your risk of new skin cancers by almost 23%. And that's twice a day. The issue is it doesn't last long. So it only lasts as long as you keep taking it. And also, as all, it can also reduce your number of precancers as well. So those are some other things you can do to kind of boost your ability to fight things off. That's super helpful. And also, you know, um, one thing that people don't remember, or at least in our setting don't remember, is that um, even though they are, and I, you touched on a little bit with tanning beds, um, you know, even though they're not like in a lot of people, I am a guilty of this as a teenager, my mom would like make me go to the tanning bed like five times in the beginning of summer, because I would get a little bit tan in this tanning bed and wouldn't burn. And so, you know, as I got more educated, I was like, mom, you know how much you increase my risk of melanoma? Holy cow. Like, um, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I know. And my, I mean, my, my, I love my mom. She's the greatest mom ever, but like, you don't even know, like you, you don't know as a kid. And so really that protection needs to start from childhood. And really that's the most important time to protect your kids all the way up, you know, until they can know to protect themselves. Absolutely. So I think a couple of points I'd like to make. One is that daily use of sun protection SPF 30 or higher reduces your risk of melanoma by 50%. That's huge. 50%. And squamous cells by 40%. Add in a hat and some good sunglasses. And that melanoma, as you know, is going to be the most common cancer in men and second only to breast cancer in women. And those aren't so preventable. Breast cancer and prostate cancer, we don't really know. But we can prevent melanoma and that the head and neck represent 9% of our bodies, but represent 25% of our melanomas. And so seriously, you know, really makes these simple daily things. And it's that day in, day out exposure that adds up over time. Every time, you know, people say, well, I haven't been in the sun. I haven't gotten a burn in years. How can I be getting this cancer? And it's like each time you're tan or your burn faded, the damage your DNA did not and accumulates over a lifetime. So as you're saying, you can't start young enough. Mm -mm. No, I remember um, my daughter and this is way off topic, but this is a really funny story and a perfect example of how much I scared my child as a, as a kid. She, there was a butterfly butterfly exchange um, at school where they were releasing these butterflies that they had um, raised from little caterpillars. And I went to pick her up and go to this thing. And I get there and my daughter is nowhere to be found. I cannot find her anywhere. So finally I say to my teacher, where's Bella? And they they point up to the window in the, in the school. And she's standing there like with her face pressed against the window. Cause she didn't have sunscreen. So she refused to go outside. And at that moment I was like, I'm so proud and mortified that I messed my kid up so bad that she's scared to go outside. But also proud of her because at three years old, she had more sense to know, like, I don't have sunscreen. I can't go outside to release these butterflies till my mom gets there. (laughs) So you you should be so proud. proud. Right. I was like, wow, this is the best day of my life, but I'm sorry. (laughs) Um, Absolutely. So, so teaching them young. And one of the issues I find over time with my patients, um, a lot of women really have been using sunscreen forever forever. And I, I look at my male patients and of which there are plenty of female patients, but men get more skin cancer than women mm-hmm. in, the, in the melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancer world. And I say, now you should use something every day. And they look at me like, why? Right. And it's greasy and I, I hate it and it irritates my eyes. And so um, addressing these issues to try to help people have thing that they'll like using they don't dread it they actually think it's doing something good for themselves to actually do this every day well and you make up bring a good point like you know i can put sunscreen on myself women have used sunscreen historically forever we put sunscreen on our kids because we're in charge of them until they're big um but men that's a huge place where you see men just do not either like to wear sunscreen or they don't 
And, and, you know, I don't mother my husband, he would kill me. So I think, you know, that's a big, it's a big target for making sure that men are educated, that this is a preventable, a preventable cancer that, that you can take care of yourself. Right. So, um, you know, I know that the work that you're doing is so important for that education, you know, and, and we're behind you. Like that is, that is a great initiative in terms of targeting men. Cause I think that would reduce melanoma and other skin cancer risks across the board for sure. Um, That's right. We don't expect you to be a hermit and sure. a vampire and only go out at night, right. but just to be smart when you're out there and right. don't just think about it when you're going to play golf or work in the yard or go to the beach is that day in day out that everybody needs to use the hat and protect themselves. And gosh, that, that, that statistic that you gave of the reduction of daily sunscreen use is huge. Like that should speak for itself, essentially. Um, the one thing that I do want to, before we get to the questions, cause there's a billion questions already in the <laughs> queue, um, is recently on the news, there was a recall for benzene. And I really would like you to talk about this. Is it in sunscreen? Was this something that happened in manufacturing? Is this something we really need to worry about? Um, so what are your thoughts about all of that? Absolutely. Have some thoughts about that. So it certainly is very scary to hear that a chemical causing um, product is in something that you're using to try to prevent cancer. You're like, you know, why bother? Right. I think the worst thing about all this is it really confuses people and makes them even more reticent to use sunscreen. So there is a private lab, independent lab, who I have no idea why they decided to test for this. They tested a lot of sunscreens mm -hmm. and particularly the sprays, but some non-sprays and some non-sunscreens have this in it. And talking to manufacturers and reading, you know, what is out there information wise is nobody has the ingredient benzene in any sunscreen formula at all. Right. So to your point, it happened in manufacturing and not all sunscreens have it in there. Um, the one we have does not, a lot of them do not, not all the sprays have benzene in them, but it was just part of the manufacturing process that the interaction sometimes with the um, container and the sunscreen can release it or the, um, manufacturing plant could have been manufacturing in their um, vats, something that may have had trace amounts that has, you know, no impact, but no, nobody wants to put benzene on them and certainly not on their kids. Sure. So I think the reassurance that the public really needs to hear, you know, make sure yours is just the non-benzene containing sunscreens and yeah, feel good about that. List. We can, we can be a link the list that they gave of the sunscreens that were recalled so that people can check to make sure. But I think, I think just hearing your reassurance is super um, helpful to listeners for sure. And I think going forward, there's going to be a lot more robust testing. And yeah. so that, you know, consumers will not need to worry as much, but we just don't need another reason to not use sunscreen when, again, I keep belaboring it, but the epidemic of skin cancer. And I don't know if you want to, tell your statistics of, you know, what you have with melanoma and what you see. I mean, it's hard to, because a lot of our melanoma patients, especially, and I'm sure that you see this as well, like they, their sun damage happened in their teens and in their twenties. It didn't happen necessarily five years ago or two years ago or one year ago. And so I think, um, you know, the take home message obviously is, for, for us is really in terms of prevention moving forward, um, we really need to target teenagers and school age people and men and, you know, and get the message out to folks that sunscreen is going to save your life, whether it's from sun damage that hasn't yet happened or to prevent further sun damage from happening. I think, you know, for me, that's, that's really where my mission comes. Like I just, if, if we prevent more melanomas from happening because of wearing daily sunscreen, it makes my life and everyone else's life a lot easier moving forward, right? So um, I don't know. I just, I, we could talk about this for hours. I could, I could <laughs> get on a soapbox for a million years, but um, there are so many questions. So I'm gonna try to keep us a little bit organized. I wanna start with some easy ones. Um, 
Harvey from our chat kind of was asking about aerosol sunscreens. Um, you know, it's saying it's not on the list. Like, is it is a mineral? Is, are aerosol sunscreen mineral? Are they chemical? Are they safe to use? Sort of, what are your thoughts about aerosols? Well, I, I don't love aerosols, but those are the ones, particularly the men in my family love to use. Right. Like I give them a lotion. They're like, I'm not using that. I'm like, okay, here's the aerosol. And they prefer it. But to remember, you don't just sit there and spray yourself. You can spray it in your hand and rub it on, or you can spray it on and then you need to rub it on. You don't just spray it and go. So you need to make sure you're getting some coverage. With the benzene issue, I think that's the biggest issue with aerosols. Aerosols can be chemical and mineral, mm -hmm. um, but that they are not on the list, I would say at this point. And then going forward, I think you'll see a lot more safety, but I know the ones we have in our office, we just got noticed that they're benzene free. It's all mineral aerosolized spray. Um, yeah. So I think you just look for the list. Yeah, and, and, and certainly don't spray around your face. No, exactly. And you you make a really good point too about aerosols. Like if you if you're like spraying it like this, it's not really getting on your skin. And that's why like when we have people that are like the aerosols, the only one I'll use, our education then becomes spray and rub so that you can make sure you got an even you know coating of sunscreen because that's the whole point. You got to shake the bottle because of you know, and you should shake your sunscreen anyway because of settling. Um, and then the other thing is, I mean, I think that there are places where the aerosol sunscreen is helpful, like parts of your hair. If for some reason you forgot your hat and you have spray sunscreen in your car, or, um, like we use it like all over my, you know, my stepson's head before he puts his hat on. So like, you know, it, you there are, are really helpful areas <laughs> to use spray. No, <laughs> there are really good places to use spray sunscreen um, if you're using it correctly as well. So like if you're only going to use spray, at least you're using sunscreen, just make sure you use it correctly is what I kind and of And again, you don't want to inhale it. Very that's true. really harmful. That's why one of the reasons we're not big fans of it. But again, no. it's, if you must. <laughs> that's how I feel. Like if you must use it over nothing, <laughs> use it correctly is how I kind of feel. Um, okay. And then, so, oh, um, Jennifer Bukowski and some other people had asked about the fabric softener with the SPF closing. And it's just because it relaxes the fibers. So then it makes it more likely that that sun will be able to get through and, um, using dryer sheets, there is fabric softener and dryer sheets. So you just have to be careful. I know that in some of the sunscreen or I'm sorry, some of the UPF clothing, um, in the brochures that we have, it does say that not to use fabric softener and stuff in the brochure. So whether or not that comes with your clothes, um, it's just one more thing, you know, to keep ahead of time. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Um, Jerome Ward wants to know what kind of lip balm um, that you can recommend that doesn't have any harmful chemicals in it. Well, I think that circles us back to how, you know, our chemical sunscreens are only zinc, um, if you have concerns, I mean, there are zinc blocks out there, lip balms, they're a little harder to find, but they are out there. Um, there are some really good, I like the outdoors sports type of sun, uh, lip balms because they really stay on and have the higher numbers, mm -hmm. but you have to reapply, of course, with those. So they're safe. And if you really have concerns, then there are all mineral zinc blocks that don't look white like the lifeguard and you can also use the white thick ones like the lifeguard if you yeah. like that look for sure that's great it is definitely a fashion choice for sure um harvey wanted to know what about waterproof sunscreen reapplication like is there a time frame um i have an answer but i'll let you do to handle that because that's your specialty so oh no see see if we agree how about we're that? a team so, that's right <laughs> so right now the fda the testing is for either it is water resistant to 40 minutes or to 80 minutes and it's not waterproof it's water resistant right so if you're getting out of the ocean or out of the pool and you're wiping it off when you're toweling off then you're gonna have to reapply more frequently than it says what it was saying is it is you can be in the water for 40 minutes and still have if it SPF, it will still have that SPF of 40 after 40 minutes of being in the sun. So it's based 
with any sunscreen, you need to reapply whether you're in the water or not. Um, but if you're toweling off, then you probably need to reapply more frequently. Yeah. And to you, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> um, Robin wanted to know about if you have an opinion on uh, Tinosorb or Tinosorb MS. I'm not totally sure what that is. So I'm hoping that you do, um, if I'm being honest. She said she's ordering sunblock from Canada. I'm not sure. So I think we could talk for a moment about why don't we have these other sunblocks in the US that there have been many that have applied for FDA approval over 20 years um, to the FDA and that the sunscreens abroad are considered cosmetic, whereas in the US is considered an over-the-counter drug. And right. so there needs to be more robust testing. And particularly since all this has come up about the oxybenzone, there has to even be more testing. And the issue is a lot of these sunscreens are going off patent. So the companies are not willing to spend millions of dollars to get into the FDA, in, through the FDA US market. So I think that is um, to tell you that there are great other options out there, but our strenuous which I don't think is stringent, which is not necessarily bad sure. uh, to make sure things are safe. It's just not met that level of scrutiny to be available in the US. Okay. Maybe they still will, there'll be new products out. Uh, we hope one day longer. Uh, um, yeah. You never know. How about, um, Arthur wants to know how long is sunscreen good after their expiration date? Zero days. Mm -hmm. And so even sometimes really you should be using it. You shouldn't be letting it expire. So if you're using it properly, the amount you're actually supposed to be using, I, I'm sorry, I'm getting on my soapbox. I'm getting way too preachy, but that to reapply, re replace it. If it's expired, just get a new bottle. Don't yeah, use it beyond. Well, true. And then also some sunscreen, like you have to be careful. Cause if you're somebody who like, for example, leaves your sunscreen in the car, in your golf bag, um, and in that heat, you know, that can degrade the chemicals as well. And so if it looks like a funny color, AKA to start turning yellow, or if like the consistency isn't the same as it was before, even if it's not to the expiration date, you probably should throw it away. Yeah, it smells funny. Yeah. Um, the, Lisa was asking um, about a comment about the environmental working group sunscreen guide. Um, you know, I, everywhere you look has a list of the top 10 sunscreens, list of the top, you know, safest sunscreens. And I guess, um, you know, what are, what are your thoughts about the, the sunscreen guide that the environmental working group has put together? Oh, I will say things briefly. I'm going to really get your <laughs> opinion on that. I think the environmental working group has great intentions to keep consumers safe and be advocates for consumers. I think the balance of the information, again, where you take that sound bite, you take, you take that one early preliminary study and you run with it. And mm -hmm. so now the sunscreens um, and those of us who care deeply about skin cancer prevention um, are trying to really get the science out there more about what it really means and that a lot of sunscreens are safe and to not necessarily throw them away or be scared of using them. Um, but that I love that the FDA is now going back and making the companies prove that it's safe, just like the zinc and the titanium. So I think if you're concerned, just use mineral sunblocks. Right. And don't, don't worry about the others. So if you have any concerns, there are great numbers. There used to be just yucky zinc ones, and now there's great ones. Yeah, they're, they're actually a lot of really helpful, useful um micronized. They blend really well. Um, we tried to keep a running list of sunscreens that folks told us they really liked. Um, because I know, you know, there's, there actually is some really good data out there that shows that the most important aspect of a sunscreen to some consumers is actually how it feels on their skin. And so, um, you know, we looked at that data, we looked at hundreds of examples. We looked at the environmental working group list. I think that list is good if you have zero idea where to start and you're someone that is at home Googling what sunscreen should I buy. Um, but again, I think you're right. I think a, there are many, many sunscreens that are safe. And I think if you're someone who is worried about 
you know, chemicals and what things you're putting in your body. I think the mineral sunscreen is really the easy choice because it's, it doesn't absorb. So you don't have to read labels quite as closely in terms of, you know, does this have oxybenzone in it? Is this something that's going to cause me, you know, an issue down the line? And so, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think we can say that enough times. Um, and there's not one right that- answer. I think right. as you have said, you know, the best one is the one you'll use. Right. Yeah. So yes. like people are asking like, what about this brand? What about this brand? And really it's, it's use your sun, use your best judgment with all the data that you have and wear sunscreen. I think that, you know, a lot of these questions, unfortunately are, um, ones that we can't really give you a direct answer to like, is Sunbum brand good? I don't sure if it, if you wear it, it's great. Right. So um, I mean, some, some of the higher numbers, like when you get really high concentration of chemicals, sometimes they're irritating. Right. So I will say, you know, if you start using SPF of, you know, 60 and 70 and hundred, you know, you are much more likely to have irritation from some of those. And if you have sensitive skin, if you have acne rosacea, where your skin is sensitive, well, you know, lean more towards, um, the minerals, but that, you know, the main thing is to protect yourself. Right. Um, Maureen says that before my husband passed away from melanoma, there was a theory to not bother above going above 50 plus SPF in sunscreen that, you know, buying 50, 75 or a hundred, um, was just a waste of money. Is that still the case? I think the SPFs are not your, like where you should focus your attention. Right. I mean, you know, what do you think about that? I, I personally don't think I shop for, for sunscreen based on the FP, SPF because you should be reapplying it. Correct. And you should apply it thick enough. Right. To begin with. So the concern is if you have an SPF 15 and you put it on like people do versus how they do in the studies, you probably have SPF of four. So that is where kind of the SPF 30 really landed. And that um, a lot of us, thought for many years had to do with time in the sun but the SPF has a lot of different factors what's your latitude what's your skin type all these different variables that depend on it's just a measure of how long you know if you put an SPF of four you can't stay in very long if you burn easily Mm -hmm. if you have SPF of 50 maybe you can stay in longer but at the higher concentrations you're not gaining a whole lot more than a chance of being irritated And a lot of countries kind of look to Australia, they'll kind of cap it at 50, I believe. Yeah. And um, the other thing is that like, there's so many different application forms that I think people get really confused. Like, you know, it's in my powder of my um, foundation. It's in my foundation. It's in my, you know, blush. You know, there's so many places where you can find sunscreen containing material. And, and one of the folks that put a a comment in the, in the chat box was that she has a powder form of sunscreen, um, that like has a brush and you like kind of put it on like loose foundation. Um, she's worried about using it, but I, I, I think that that's fine if she's wearing it in terms of like for everyday use kind of thing. What do you, think about that? Well, there's not as good of testing and robust data around powders. Right. We do do have them and people love them. I think they're probably better as a touch up. Right. That is your only source. If you have access to going into like a a black light anywhere on your powder and see if it's blocking that light, there's something called a sunscreener that is out there. I think you can order them online and you can see if you're covered with your sunblock or where you've missed a spot. And if you compare, you know, half your face with your moisturizer and half the face with the powder and see, compare that coverage. Yeah. Um, So one of the other things, and I don't know how much we want to actually get into it, but um, Robin had asked about reef protection um, in terms of, you know, Hawaii thinking about banning certain ingredients and things like that. I think, you know, for me, and this is something that got brought up two years ago, whenever I was looking at, um, you know, researching for my presentation, I feel like this is something that's ongoing. It's, it's an issue that they're continuing to, to do research and make recommendations. And, um, 
what are your thoughts about about that safety? Well, it's really interesting. Um, there's Dr. Karen Glantz out of um, Pennsylvania, and she had suggested I listen in on this um, testifying in front of this uh, National Academies about the reef this week and or last week. Yeah. And it was very interesting to hear all the scientists and interspersed with that was the head of um, the American Cancer Society, the American Academy of Dermatology and saying, you know, please don't let uh, the safety of sunscreens get lost or the importance of sunscreen in this. Right. So there is very preliminary data that does not mimic real life conditions that show some concerns about some of the chemicals with sunscreens. Now, oxybenzone is in a lot of other products besides sunscreens. It's in cosmetics, it's in plastics. So sunscreens are not the only source. It does appear that there might be some concerns, but there are by no means clearly of concern and that a lot more needs to be done. So I think what you're saying is you research it and then more data says, well, maybe that initial data was mm -hmm. so in the lab and not mimicking real life situations that much higher concentrations than you ever find in the reef itself. But I think it'd be good to know what the implications are before we are like, oops, they were right. Or oops, they were wrong. Um, so the, the jury's still out on exactly the impact, I think is the bottom I line. Think, well, and that, I mean, that is as true a statement as could ever be made because they just don't know. I mean, they're working on it, but there's, I feel like a lot of it, they're not 100% sure. And I think, you know, before we make global recommendations about that, I think we need to get all of the information. At least that's how I like to try to make recommendations. And it just takes time. And right. It, just, it takes time and good science. Um, so I want to try to, I'm trying to read through some of these are really, really long. So I'm trying to read through them really quickly. Um, some people just are, are kind of making comments about their concerns that they're wearing sunscreen, they're wearing protective clothing, they're trying to seek out shade. And at the end of the day, they still have like a little line where their watch is and they're still getting some sun. And so, you know, obviously that's a worrisome scenario for folks. Um, what could you say to reassure them or what could they do better um, to prevent that? Well, I think you just have to do the best you can and live yeah. life. Right. And that um, make sure if you are that compliant that you're taking some vitamin D because mm -hmm. you're doing a great job of staying yes. out of the sun. Well, their skin will darken even just with heat a little bit too. So particularly melasma on the face but that you, know, you just do the best you can and you don't have to stay inside. And that is what I would suggest. Yeah, you're doing all the things that you can. And as long as you're reapplying the sun exposed area sunscreens, I think that there's not a thing else you can do and, and you should just keep doing your thing and, and good work. Um, Pam wanted to make sure that vitamin B3 was the, um, was the supplement that you had mentioned and I believe that that's the case. It is nicotinamide or niacinamide. So do not get niacin, you'll be miserable. <laughs> Sometimes when you do take that, it can interfere with statins. So if you have statins, you need to check with your doctors. Sometimes it can cause a little upset stomach. So, you know, go slowly and take it with food. And occasionally that one will cause flushing. So, but usually it, it does it like the niacin does. So don't save money and say, oh, I found niacin, it's so much cheaper. Well you won't want to take it. No, not at all. <laughs> um, Leslie, I don't want to ignore your question about what kind of drug source sunscreen that we use, but I think um, just for the sake of, you know, staying neutral, um, because we, you know, we, we really recommend to everyone that you use whatever sunscreen makes you feel the, safe in terms of what chemicals and things like that. So we've talked about this kind of at nauseum. There's not a right or wrong sunscreen. Um, if you're worried about absorption, stick to the mineral-based ones. Um, I know a lot of the baby sunscreens especially are, are mineral-based. Um, if you're looking for like a general recommendation, um, I always tell patients, you know, most of the baby lines are going to have zinc and titanium and be mineral-based. So, you know, if you're 
running in and out and have to grab a sunscreen, grab a baby line one um, for the most part in general. I think if we talk about babies that this summer when I see a baby out and I just kind of go, oh, they don't have on a hat. They're like an infant. <laughs> right. And so really young babies need to be just out of the sun. Mm -hmm. and if they are out, have on a hat and loose fitting clothing and just cover them up. You're not right. supposed to be putting sunscreen on infants, but Correct. to really keep them out. You know, people will take them like in their baby carrier and be out. And I just, I go into apoplexy, <laughs> I just stand down, I stand down. I know. I know. That's what I have to like control myself to be like, why are you not putting sunscreen on or at least covering up that child? <laughs> so I, and, and the general recommendation, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you shouldn't be using sunscreen on babies younger than six months that like, we should really be making sure we cover versus sunscreen. Um, you know, some of the other things that um, I just want to make sure that we make clear is that, you know, sunscreen is not the end all be all. We already have covered that. We already know we need to make sure that we protect ourselves in all the other ways that you mentioned. You gave really great supplements that people can use. I know people are very nervous about their, their vitamin D when they're wearing all this sunscreen and, um, you know, and certainly you should supplement your vitamin D if your vitamin D is low. Um, we did also, there was actually a, a clinical trial that shows that you can get all the vitamin D that you would obtain from the sun um, first thing in the morning or like in the after, like late afternoon in just five minutes. So if you are looking for, you know, oh, well, I can't take a vitamin D supplement. Like you don't need to be out in the sun to get all of that you need all day long. Like you get it in a really quick burst of sunlight. Absolutely. And I think probably this audience may be much more compliant than, than other people. So I think that's just great information for them for sure. Um, Harvey, yeah, Polaris sunglasses are actually really good. They help block a lot of the sun um, rays that you wouldn't, you know, that just, you know, a dollar sunscreen or I'm sorry, a dollar sunglasses that you buy off the rack at the dollar store would not necessarily have. Um, but you will get some protection just from those cheap sunglasses too. So, you know, don't spend $500 on a pair of sunglasses. I always time. lose anything. That's yeah. not every sunglasses I spend more than $25 I lose. So yeah, that's what but they have the sticker and you know, they have the sticker on them always. So look at that sticker. That's right. So Beth, are there any other major big things that you would like to kind of impart upon our audience before we, we call it a day? Well, I've enjoyed talking with you so much and I, I feel so passionately about this issue and getting the information out there that about sunscreens and that they're safe and why they're important, but also really emphasizing these other ways to stay safe and be protected. And we can look to Australia. I mean, they don't let kids outside unless there's shade on their playground. That's amazing. And they plant trees and that we worry about hats looking like they're a sign of gang membership versus they won't let a child outside without a hat on. So I think we can all look to improve our culture of in this country and continue to benefit from that. That's great information. Thank you so much again for joining us. Um, if there are any follow-up questions, um, I will be sure to forward them along to you. Um, everybody just remember to stay safe this summer, wear sunscreen in the winter and the summer and the fall and the spring and all the time, um, cover up um, and just stay safe. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Everybody have a wonderful night.